<clears throat> okay. This is topic 33 of your A2 organic. Yesterday, we have looked at carboxylic acid acting as an acid due to the delocalization on the COO group. So the negative charge is not only concentrated on the oxygen atom, but it is being uh, spread out, or another name, technical name for it, is delocalized throughout the COO group. And the more spread out a negative charge is, the more stable the anion is. And if the anion is more stable, more likely it will be formed. So ionization can occur uh, at a bigger extent. Okay, so just remember more ionization, more ions, more H plus, more acidic. We've also looked at the behavior of carboxylic acid as an acid where it can react with metal, alkali, and also any carbonate to form the salt. The salt of this reaction would be a metal carbonate salt, and that would usually be an ionic um, compound. Okay. Next, we are going to look at um, further oxidation of carboxylic acids. Now, in AS, we learned that uh, primary alcohol, for example, can be oxidized to, what will it be oxidized to first? Primary alcohol. It will first be oxidized to aldehyde, and then after aldehyde, it is oxidized to, does anyone remember? Carboxylic acid, okay? And that's it. It stops at carboxylic acid. But in your A2 syllabus, there are two carboxylic acids that can be further oxidized. So far, this reaction is your AS reaction, um, uh, oxidations of alcohol from your AS syllabus. For your A2, this particular carboxylic acid, particularly the methanoic acid, can be oxidized further into um, carbon dioxide, you will see later on, okay? And then the second type of carboxylic acid would be ethane dioic acid, okay? So you have to be careful when answering this. For your AS syllabus, you must stop here, okay? You're not expected, expected to go beyond the oxidation of methanoic acid, but in A2, Methanoic acid will be oxidized further. So uh, the learning objective is to recognize that some, okay, only some carboxylic acids can be further oxidized. That is methanoic acid and ethane dioic acid. Ethane dioic acid, the, the word di, the, the <clears throat> di represents two COOH group. Okay, I'll show you the structure. So carboxylic acids usually cannot be oxidized further. Only methanoic acid and ethane dioic acid. So please make sure you, all, you highlight these two carboxylic acids that can be oxidized further. Other than these two, they cannot be oxidized further and they just stop being oxidized there. Okay, what's the reason um, for methanoic acid being able to oxidize further is, uh, remember, when methanoic acid is being oxidized, methanoic itself is a reducing agent. Yeah, remember, someone who is being oxidized, they will act as the opposite um, agent. So here we see that methanoic acid is actually a strong reducing agent. Because it is a strong reducing agent, it can be oxidized further. Let me just go back to this to talk about the reagents and conditions for the oxidation of methanoic acid. Since methanoic acid is already a strong reducing agent, you can use a mild oxidizing agent. You don't need to use a strong oxidizing agent, okay? 
amount of today oxidizing agent is phalanx or tolens reagent. Do you still remember this reagent to test for what does it test for? Aldehyde. Good. Um, and the condition is you just need to warm it or heat it. Okay. So it is sufficient to use a mild oxidizing agent because your uh, methanoic acid is already uh, a strong reducing agent. That means it wants to be oxidized. You can also, of course, use a stronger oxidizing agent like your acidified potassium manganate or acidified potassium dichromate. So all these four reagents can oxidize your methanoic acid to carbon dioxide. Okay, so uh, the, the product of the further oxidation of methanoic acid is carbon dioxide CO2. The equation, okay, if we were to write down the full equation of the oxidation of methanoic acid, um, I think you don't need the structure of Methanoic acid, you, you should know that it's just the carboxylic acid with one carbon atom. Okay. The full equation where square bracket O is like a symbol, okay, a representation of representation of oxidizing agent. If we are doing organic chemistry, we can use this short shortcut or short form, all right? But if this was in inorganic chemistry, you need to write down the full formula of the reagent that you are using. If it's potassium manganate, you have to balance KMnO4 and then H plus, and then you have to worry about um, other things like water and etc. That's where your half equation from the data booklet comes uh, into play. Just get my notes. Okay. okay. <clears throat> uh, the half equation, if you see electrons anywhere in the equation, that's not your full equation, okay? Full equation must not contain any electrons. This is the equation for oxidation, okay? You lose electrons, so the half equation for oxidation. If you want to write down the full equation of the reduction, you have to look at um, a particular uh, reducing, uh, sorry, oxidizing agent. You have to follow which oxidizing agent you are using. So if we are looking at the... Where's my data booklet? Okay, from your data booklet here, if we use manganate MnO4, that means you need to use the half equation for, for reduction as this one. Okay, MnO4 minus plus 8H plus plus 5 electrons to form Mn2 plus plus 4H2O. Okay, and that is manganate being reduced, whereas your methanoic acid is being oxidized, okay? But for organic chemistry, this representation is enough. You balance the oxygen, okay, come in. You balance the oxygen just like how you would balance your normal um, balance equation, okay? Do you remember for reducing agent, what's the symbol? Reducing agent, square bracket H, okay? So square bracket O is for oxidizing because during oxidation, we gain oxygen. During reduction, we gain hydrogen, okay? Okay, um, we are now on page four, Danish, of the notes. So observation during this oxidation would again depends on the reagent that you use. If you use phalanx reagent, the observation that you would expect is to see a red precipitate being produced, okay? That's the positive 
uh, observation to say yes, that means methanoic acid has been oxidized. If you use Tolan's reagent, you would expect a silver metal or silver layer being formed around the test tube if there is oxidation happening. Okay. And then if you use potassium manganate, I think you are all familiar with that already. The purple color of potassium manganate would turn colorless, or we say the purple color decolorizes. And lastly, there is a typo in your notes. It should be using acidified potassium dichromate. This one, change the typo in your notes which is the last point. In your notes, it says KMNO4, but I want you to change it to K2Cr207, which is potassium dichromate. So if you use potassium dichromate to oxidize your methanoic acid, the observation would be orange to green. Okay? So you can see that the oxidation of methanoic acid is, uh, the reaction is observable. All right? So you can see uh, the positive uh, results of oxidation, and if there is a negative re result of oxidation, you shouldn't be seeing any of these uh, listed uh, changes. So, sorry, I forgot to mention, when methanoic acid is being oxidized, it produces carbon dioxide and water. Okay? All right, that's methanoic acid. Now we're going to look at the second carboxylic acids that can be oxidized. Other than these two mentioned, we would assume that they do not undergo further oxidation. Um, okay, so the oxidation of ethane dioic acid, HOOC, COOH, I'll show you the structure in a bit with warm acidified potassium manganate to carbon dioxide. So you can see the product is also the same-ish. That is the structure of a diethanoic acid or ethane dioic acid. You've got two COOH and that's where the name di comes from. Do you notice that the reagents only include potassium manganate and potassium dichromate? We cannot use tolens or phalanx, because tolens and phalanx are weak oxidizing agents. They cannot oxidize the ethane dioic acid. Okay, so just remind yourself, tolens and phalanx are not strong enough to oxidize Sometimes you will see the formula of ethane dioic acid written down as COOH bracket 2. It's the same thing, okay? It means COOH, COOH. You just need, um, you need the potassium manganate to work in an acidified condition and you just warm them and oxid oxidation should occur, should happen uh, for ethane dioic acid, okay? So ethane dioic acid is not a strong reducing agent unlike your methanoic acid. It can only be oxidized by stronger oxidizing agents. So you need a more uh, harsh condition for this reaction to happen. Okay, so this reaction is a common practice for titration as well. Okay, so uh, we call this a standardization reaction. What's a standardization reaction? It is a titration to work out the exact concentration of an unknown solution. So if you haven't realized already, titration is usually used to find an information about an unknown reagent using a known reagent. So you notice that in a titration, usually there are two reactants, right? One of the reactants, we know the concentration. 
The other one, we do not know the concentration. Okay, you would notice this in paper three. So this is what we call standardization. If we want to know an information about the unknown reagent, we will titrate it with a known reagent. So what I mean by known and unknown is we know the concentration, we know at least the volume. Whereas for the other reactants, we probably only know the volume, but we don't know the concentration. So that's the purpose of titration, not because we like to, we like to see color change or whatever. It's usually to find information like number of moles or volume or concentration. So what can we do? A solution of ethane dioic acid with sulfuric acid added, so that's just to add it, acidify, can be used in titration to standardize a solution of potassium manganate. So because ethane dioic acid reacts with potassium manganate in, in an oxidation reaction, then we can work out the concentration of potassium manganate, okay? So how? We measure out solid ethane dioic acid. So if we know the mass of ethane dioic acid, we know the volume that we make the solution up to. That means we know the concentration of the ethane dioic acid. And then we titrate it against potassium manganate. That's our unknown. And we do that. We carry out the titration as normal. Okay, it's easy to use potassium manganate for titration. You do not need an indicator. Okay, why do you not need an indicator here? Then how do you know where the endpoint is? The color of potassium manganate is very distinct, right? You've seen potassium manganate like very dark purple. And if it is being oxidized, sorry, if it is being reduced, you can definitely see the purple to colorless. Very obvious, the change. That's why you don't need an indicator. Whereas for potassium dichromate, um, the color from orange to green is not so obvious. It's very subtle. Okay, so when you carry out titration, you want to use reagents that can give you a sharp or obvious color change. Okay, without using an indicator. You don't need an indicator for potassium manganate. Okay. Um, so at the end point, when all the ethane dioic acid has been oxidized, a drop of purple manganese solution turns the solution pink. Okay, so this is starting from ethane dioic acid is colorless. And then the moment you see a permanent pale pink color in your conical flask, that's the end of your reaction. Okay, so just now I mentioned purple to colorless but it all depends on who is inside your conical flask. If you have ethane dioic acid in your conical flask, you would expect it to be colorless first. Okay, so if you just imagine this, we have... Um, so there is your COOH2, and in your burette is your potassium manganate. So you would imagine COOH is colorless. So the color change would be colorless to pale pink. If your contents in the conical flask is dark purple, that means you are in excess already. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> the balanced ion equation for this redox reaction is, so we are going to just first, write down the balance equation using square bracket O, okay? If this was, um, if we use, if you don't use square bracket O, say this is a question in inorganic chemistry, then you have to use balance the MnO4 minus equation and also the oxidation equation for the ethane dioic acid, okay? So let's just draw, I would draw the structure so you can see the change. So that's your ethane dioic acid being oxidized, okay, so to CO2 plus 2H2O. So you just have to balance. There are two carbons here. That means you must need 
to carbon dioxide. Okay. Uh, after balancing the carbon dioxide, you want to balance the oxygen. The way you balance the oxygen, you count this square bracket O as one oxygen. So on the left side, you've got four, six oxygen. Here we've got only four oxygen. So how many oxygen do we need to balance the equation? Two oxygen. Okay. So in organic chemistry, it's simple. Do I have the equation for... Oh, okay. All right. I'll give you the equation for um, if we don't use the square bracket. Okay. So if you can find space anywhere later to copy this down, um, then uh, you can copy it down. Okay. So the manganese ions form can catalyze the reactions. This is an example of autocatalysis. Okay, so the next point is related to this equation. What if now we don't write down the square bracket O, but we write down the full equation redu uh, reduction for manganate and oxidation for the ethane dioic acid, okay? So can you please copy this down? Because I have seen one exam paper where they expect you to write down the half equation for the oxidation of the ethane dioic acid. And I've also written down the change in oxidation, uh, oxidizing, oxidation number is in the carbon. It goes from plus three to plus four. So this is more related to the to the last point that um, it says that the manganese ions form. So when you form this manganese ions in the product, this acts as an autocatalyst. Autocatalyst means you don't need to add catalyst from outside. The product of the reaction is already a catalyst for the same reaction. <clears throat> Well, the most important uh, equation would be this one because that's not something that you can find in your data booklet. Whereas the half equation for reduction can be found in the data booklet. And I think by now you should be able to combine oxidation reaction and reduction reaction. But first, what must you make sure before you combine these two half equations? What must be balanced? The number of electrons, okay? So you've got two electrons for oxidation, five electrons for reduction, and uh, you can't just add them up before you make the numbers same. So this is the full equation after you deal with the number of electrons, and then you tidy up, and the full equation is given like that. This is not so much required for organic chemistry, but in organic chemistry, if they want to be mean, they can ask you to write the full equation without using the square bracket O. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll let you copy this down first. Right, so um, I repeat the last point just now. The manganese ions form can catalyze the reaction. So for this reaction, you don't need to add cat catalyst from outside. The moment you produce the manganese 2 plus, this now will speed up the reaction. Okay, that's what it means by autocatalysis. The product of the reaction catalyzes the same reaction. You don't have to add manganese ions from outside. Okay. okay, questions. 3.1. Why is methanoic acid never prepared by refluxing methanol with acidified potassium dichromate solution? Okay, so I'll just draw 
um, some structure first. This is methanol. Acidified potassium dichromate is an oxidizing agent. You first oxidize it into an aldehyde. And then you oxidize it into a methanoic acid. So why can't I use this reaction? I got methanoic acid here. Why can I not use this reaction to collect my methanoic acid or to produce methanoic acid? What do you think? Will the oxidation reaction stops here? No, it will go further to form CO2. Okay, so the reason for that is because methanoic acid can be further oxidized into carbon dioxide and water. So if you think oxidizing methanol to methanoic acid is a good way to produce methanoic acid, um, it's not because the methanoic acid will not be stable. It will get further oxidized to carbon dioxide and water. Okay. The next question, in a titration between ethane dioic acid with potassium manganate solutions, suggest why the solution of ethane dioic acid is heated before adding potassium manganate. So if you compare oxidation of ethane dioic acid, you need to warm or heat the reaction mixture, whereas when oxidizing methanoic acid, you don't need to heat the potassium manganate, okay? You heat the phalanx or tolens, but not the potassium manganate or the dichromate, right? So this already, you can already see that with methanoic acid, you do not need a harsh condition. You do not need to heat the strong oxidizing agent. Whereas for ethane dioic acid, you need to heat or warm the already strong oxidizing agent. The hint there is this. This reaction requires a catalyst, okay? That means the reaction doesn't happen itself. You need to either add a catalyst or provide heat to overcome the activation energy. Activation energy is the, the first hill that they need to climb in order to produce the product. Okay, so to explain, the heat is to speed up the reaction because the redox reaction is initially slow before you form the Mn2 plus ions. This Mn2 plus ions act as a catalyst. But once you have the Mn2 plus ions formed, then the reaction will just happen uh, quickly because it acts as a catalyst. Okay. So we are done with carboxylic acid. We now move on to the next functional group. It is a derivative of carboxylic acid because it comes from carboxylic acid and it is called the esters. So your esters, ester functional group is COOC, whereas your carboxylic acid is COOH. They're related. Well, esters come from carboxylic acid as well as alcohol, okay? Um, okay, so how do we form esters? We want to look at the formation of esters. Describe the reaction with acyl chlorides to form esters using ethyl ethanoate. Recall the reaction by which esters can be produced. Alcohols with acyl chlorides using the formation of ethyl ethanoate and phenyl benzoate. Okay, so 
Acyl chloride is a functional group that you have not met yet, but you will meet after esters, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So what is acyl chloride? Acyl chloride is when you have a C double bond O carbonyl and the chloride is chlorine. And that is the functional group of COCl. This acyl chloride comes from carboxylic acid. Later on, you will see how carboxylic acid turns into an acyl chloride. Acyl chlorides actually behave similarly like carboxylic acid, but it is even more reactive than carboxylic acid. Okay, so you can see acyl chloride as being the cousin, the more reactive cousin of carboxylic acid. As mentioned just now, since acyl chloride behaves like carboxylic acid, it can undergo esterification with alcohol. Okay, so this is called an ethanol chloride. You have two carbons, so it's called ethanoyl chloride, reacting with ethanol. If this was carboxylic acid, you will lose um, the hydrogen from alcohol and the OH from carboxylic acid to form ester, correct? Same thing. Instead of losing the OH, we will lose H and Cl from acyl chloride. Okay, so um, I wish the, the structure was written the other way around so you can see where uh, the new connection or the new bond is being formed. Okay, I have another example later on. So um, you just highlight what is being lost during this reaction. Okay, so this is where your acyl chloride part, just like your carboxylic acid part, and this is your alcohol part. And can you see that you form HCl because you have lost hydrogen from ethanol and you have lost chloride from the ethanol chloride. Naming of the ester is literally the same thing. Okay, the only difference is your starting point, but it behaves just like carboxylic acid. So naming them, your alcohol bit is the uh, ethyl and your acyl chloride, the name takes after the carboxylate. Okay, so you can see there's one, two, so ethanoid, just like carboxylic acid. Okay, phenols with acyl chlorides. In the previous topics, uh, I think it was the previous one before this, you saw that phenols do not react with carboxylic acid. It doesn't form esters with carboxylic acid. Okay, so just remind yourself that. However, Phenols can react with the more reactive cousin of carboxylic acid, which is the acyl chloride. Okay, so bear in mind, just make a note for yourself, phenols do not react with carboxylic acid, but phenols can react with its cousin, because that cousin is reactive. Okay, um, so the learning objective for this is... Um, Phenol benzoid. Okay, so we will look at this. For the reaction of acyl chlorides with phenols to occur, you need heat and a base. Um, does that, do they mention it anywhere in that? Yeah, okay. So you need an alkaline condition and you need to heat the reaction. Otherwise, esterification, it can happen at um, room temperature. Oh, I also forget, forgot to mention uh, color esterification of alcohols and carboxylic acids. It is a reversible reaction. Do you still remember? Acids, alcohols, 
Acidification, it's a reversible reaction. But here, acyl chloride with alcohol is a full, it goes to full completion. Okay, so at um, this reaction goes to completion, which means more esters will be formed, more esters formed. So higher yield of esters. Whereas if it's alcohol and acid, it's a reversible reaction. So if they ask you what's a method to produce an ester efficiently and quickly, better you use acyl chloride instead of carboxylic acid, okay? Okay, I will not talk about the mechanisms because we haven't covered the mechanisms yet. So back to uh, phenols with an acyl chloride. Same thing, here we use an ethanol chloride as a substitute or as an alternative to carboxylic acid. Phenol is acting as like an alcohol, but it's slightly different, okay? But you would expect phenol to lose its H+, plus because phenol is acidic, it loses that H+, plus easily, and ethanol chloride loses its chlorine. So, H removed, chlorine removed, the carbon will form a new bond with that oxygen, like an ester form, uh, an ester bond being formed, okay? So, that is your ester COO, C. Naming, this is your acyl chloride, which now becomes your carboxylate. Okay, because it's related to carboxylic acid. So the name is also like carboxylic acid. And this is your alcohol part. We don't really see phenol as being an alcohol, but uh, in terms of naming, the alcohol comes first. When your benzene ring becomes a side chain, we don't call it ben benzyl, okay? When benzene ring becomes a side chain, It is called phenyl. Just like phenylamine, the word phenyl is the benzene ring. Okay, so acyl chlorides react with phenols when heated and in the presence of a base to form esters. Okay, so um, this is just a, a little a sneak peek to what you will be uh, looking at later on. Ethanol chloride is actually an electrophile because that carbon is attached to two highly electronegative elements. Okay, so Oxygen will be delta minus, chloride will be delta minus. So can you imagine this carbon is attached to two delta minus atoms. So the po delta positive on carbon will be so big and it attracts nucleophile. Okay, your nucleophile can be charged or neutral as long as they have a lone pair to donate and phenol here is actually acting as a nucleophile so that's where the next uh the bottom explanation comes in i don't know if you have that diagram in your notes do you have it on page six ah yeah you do have it okay so the explanation for the next one 
which is this one, okay? So the base is needed to deprotonate. Deprotonate means remove H plus from phenol, okay? To form phenoxide ion. So this phenoxide ion is acting as a nucleophile. So if you imagine, but you don't know the mechanism yet, okay? The phenol will attack the carbon, the C double bond O will break, and then uh, what happens here? Oh, and then it will reform the double bond and release the chlorine uh, atom, okay? That mechanism is called the addition elimination reaction which you will look at later on, okay? Okay, so this is your acyl chloride. So we're done with esters. Esters, not much. You just have to learn esterification. You learn about uh, the reagents, the conditions, um, what it can react with, naming of esters. So it's, a, it's really a short uh, functional group for for your syllabus. The next functional group that we're going to look at is called the acyl chlorides. We've already met acyl chlorides just now, okay? So this is an example of an acyl chloride because there is the C double bond O Cl functional group. And um, so the functional group, the structural formula of the acyl chloride is COCl. Structural group of esters is COOC. For example, like that, okay? They look similar in structure to carboxylic acids, but have a chlorine atom instead of an OH group attached to the carbonyl C double bond O. So the C double bond O is your carbonyl group. Acyl chloride can be prepared by the use of carboxylic acid, as predicted, because it is a derivative of carboxylic acid. So to get an acyl chloride, you must start with carboxylic acid first. You add SOCL2, PCL5, or PCL3. The same way you would change your alcohol to halogenol alkanes. Still remember this reagent? Did they look familiar to you? SOCL2, PCL5, or PCL3. But with PCL3, there is a condition. What do you need with PCL3? Heat. You need heat with PCL3. Whereas SOCL2 and PCL5, you can use them uh, under room, room condition, okay? Okay. So acyl chlorides are more reactive, I've mentioned this already, than their cousin carboxylic acids and are therefore often used as starting materials in the production of organic compounds such as ester. So you can see that acyl chlorides are much better at producing esters than carboxylic acids, okay? Uh, formation of acyl chlorides. Uh, is there anything that you needed to copy just now? Nada, everything, okay. So formation of acyl chlorides, you recall, you need to be able to uh, recall the reactions to produce acyl chlorides using carboxylic acids with PCL3 and heat, PCL5 or SOCL2. Describe the reaction of carboxylic acids. Okay, same thing. Right, so first is using phosphorus chloride. With phosphorus chloride, you do not need any special condition. They work uh, under normal uh, condition, okay? So this is the structure. You may want to show the, uh, to draw the structure just to show that the OH group is being substituted by a chlorine atom from PCL5. Okay, so I highlight the OH. That is the one being substituted with chlorine. in COOH substituted substituted with 
fluorine atom. Okay, other products form POCl3 and not HCl3 but HCl. HCl is a gas, so it appears as white fume, steamy fume, and this is an observation. Okay, so we like a reaction that has an observation. Why? Because usually this is used as a positive test. Okay, so if you add PCL5 to an unknown compound, you produce white fume. That could be an acyl chloride or it could be an alcohol. Remember, alcohol also reacts with PCL5 to give you more or less the same products, if I can, uh, if I can remember. But um, you revisit your alcohol notes and check they may or may not be the same products. But I remember seeing HCl as a uh, white fume as an observation for alcohol as well. Okay. Next one with phosphorus chloride, you need heat. If you can, try to just avoid using phosphorus chloride because otherwise if you forget the condition, heat is required, then that reaction doesn't happen, okay? So PCL3 is the only uh, reaction that needs heat. Same thing, the OH group, the OH group in the ethanoic acid or any carboxylic acid is replaced by a chlorine atom and you form a phosphorus acid, H3PO3. So there's no observation here. They're all just colorless, okay? No fumes being produced here. And lastly, with SOCL2, which is the sulfur dichloride oxide, but I just call it SOCL2, same thing you replace the OH group of your carboxylic acid with a chlorine to form an acyl chloride, which is also ethanoyl chloride. If you got three carbons, it would be propanoyl, four carbons, butanoyl, and etc. Next one, same thing. With SOCL2, you are substituting the OH group with chlorine atom. You form a sulfur dioxide gas. This is an acidic gas, colorless. But HCl is, it appears as steamy fume. Can you add that? as an observation, steamy fume observed. Or sometimes uh, they will write it as white fume. You know, like white smoke, that's what a fume is. Okay, so last one before we go, we are just going to try constructing a balance equation using structural formula for the organic compound state any conditions necessary to show the formation okay so we want to form propanoyl chloride i would start with writing down the product first okay propanoyl chloride is when you have three carbons ch3 ch2 co CL. They want structural formula. Okay. So prop means three carbon. Carbon one, carbon two, carbon three. Uh, we're using SOCL2. So what other products will we form? SOCL2 plus SO2 and HCl. Okay. And then if I'm producing propanoyl chloride, what's my starting carboxylic acid? Propanoic acid, that's right. CH3, CH2, COOH plus SOCL2. 
Okay. So it must you must start with the the correct carboxylic acid. You cannot produce propanoyl chloride from a butanoic acid, for example. Uh, is there a condition? No special condition. That means it work. It happens at room temperature. In bracket room temperature. Next question, methanoyl chloride. So methanoyl chloride is one carbon meth. Okay. Can I move on to the next question or are you still copying this down? Done? Okay. Methanoyl chloride is one carbon. C-H-C-O-C-L. Okay. If you cannot... Visualize it, you draw it. Okay, there's nothing wrong with drawing it. So HCOCl using PCL3, what other products would you form with PCL3? H3PO3. Okay, so if you form methanoyl chloride, you need to start from methanoic acid. HCOOH plus PCL3. Is there any condition needed for this? Heat required for PCL3. Last one, butanoyl chloride. Start with the product first easiest. Butanoil is 4, CH3, CH2, CH2, CO, Cl. 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, if you cannot see it, you can quickly draw it out. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2. Okay. And the other products of using PCL5 would be Pocl3, POCL3 plus HCl. You all okay with that? And what's the starting material? Butanoic acid. The carbon of the COCl is counted as one. Okay. Okay, so just to balance this, um, and no special condition, huh? That means it happens at room temperature. Okay, so that is all for today. Tomorrow we're going to look at the reactions of acyl chloride, which we have looked at just now. Uh, with Alcohol, we know, so additional tomorrow will be with ammonia and